Karen and I had the privilege of working together during my earlier career at a company called Sterling Commerce, uh, where she was instrumental in being one of my own personal uh, coaches, if you will. And uh, she worked with me very closely as we uh, scaled an organization from a few, uh, few individuals to a very large global organization. And uh, so I personally have benefited from her advice, her counsel, her guidance, and uh, someone who I consider a dear friend and a mentor in my own career. So please uh, join me in welcoming Karen Seaman to the stage. Good evening. How are all of you? Are you good? Awesome. First thing I want to say is thank you. Um, I'll tell you, when Scott called me about this probably in November, I'm like, seriously, you want me to do this? <laughs> I felt very honored. Um, and I feel very grateful and honored with your presence here tonight. Thank you for coming. And for you online, you know what? I did a couple degrees online and um, there is nothing easy about it, and it takes a real commitment, and you have to really mean it, and good for you, good for all of you who are participating in this forum. So I have a story about Scott. <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? Um, so the first thing I have to tell you is I haven't seen Scott in probably, what, 10 years? So today when I walked into his office, we had lunch today, which was delightful. Um, first thing I noticed is like, what's this, Scott? He's got this little gray thing going on in his temples. I don't know why it is in 10 years I haven't gotten any gray and he has. I don't know, I'm not sure what the deal is with that. But um, so I was thinking about, you know, so what can I tell you about Scott? There's a lot of stories, probably a lot of them I'm not gonna tell you, let's just be honest. But there was one that I was thinking through, you know, we had many conversations in his office. He had the most awesome assistant named Gloria. She was a fabulous lady. So the three of us sometimes would sit in and have some of these conversations. And one day we were talking about kind of building the team and connecting and leadership in general. And he said, you know, I think I'm gonna write people notes. And so we kind of walked out from that and I'm like, that's really good. So, but you know what? He didn't just write people notes, like thanks for great work, the end. He would take, and he did this for his entire team. I understand he has now 4,000 people, so don't expect this. <laughs> but he took his entire team and wrote them a note and a Christmas card. But it wasn't just any note. It was personal, it was profound, and it was meaningful. And I got them as well, which was pretty wonderful. Every year, he would take time. I know this took a, a phenomenal amount of time. But you know what, a couple years ago, I got one, just out of the blue. And it's like so touching and such a phenomenal thing that he started doing before he had gray hair. <laughs> so as Scott said, 35 years of doing between coaching and just organizational development, working with people, with teams. You're gonna hear stories tonight kind of about my journey. Uh, we're gonna talk about transformational leadership we're gonna talk about the people that I get the honor of working with on that journey. Um, some stories, I'm not gonna use anybody's name, and it might be confusing at times. I thought about giving them fake names, but I was afraid I'd forget who was who. <laughs> um, so we're just gonna kinda of talk through it a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna just bring you along with some of the things that I get to do every day, um, because I decided that I have the best job on the planet. Um, so I remember my first management role. Any of you remember your first management role? Yeah, kind of a frightening event, right? I was 22, and I had people on my team, like 15 people, mostly women, and I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. And one day, one woman kind of grabbed me by the shoulders and took me over to the corner kind of had a little talking to with me. Like, you know, we kind of need to know our expectations, we need to know our goals, we need to know what's next. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was really clueless. But I think at that time I was probably a young and good leader. 
because I had more of that vision and that energy around the people and people saw that and went, yeah, let's promote her. So they did, but I, I had no idea how to be a manager. And here's the truth about management. How many of you think that all leaders are, or all managers are good leaders? No, right? I believe that management is that structure order stuff, right? It's getting the stuff right. It's all those crazy spreadsheets and being able to do the hard work of driving teams and getting things in, under control and structured. Leadership is about inspiration. It's about um, driving energy. It's about integration with something that's beyond what's in front of them. John Maxwell says, I'm going to read this here, a great leader's courage to fulfill vision comes from passion, not position. And I really agree with that because what I think the truth of the matter is a leader can be anywhere in an organization. You, don't, you do not have to have a management title to be a leader. As a matter of fact, you want to inspire and encourage leadership across the entire organization. But Mintzberg, anybody familiar with Henry Mintzberg? Got some management people in the, in the audience. There's one, I was glad. Man, like everybody knows Mintzberg, right? But he, he says, you know, that leadership and management, that, that managers and leadership is the same. And others will say, no, not so much. And I kind of agree with a gentleman from Stanford, Bob Sutton. And he says that, you know, it might be the best leader does this mixture of management and leadership. And I think what typically happens for me when I get called in is because people are really great managers they get their stuff done, and thank heavens, because if they called me in and asked me to help them do their job, I'd be in serious trouble. They'd be in serious trouble. What they really need is this bridge to learn how to be a leader. And that's kind of where I come in. And I think the first thing to me that is important for a leader is what I call leader know thyself. If you don't know yourself, and sometimes that can be a painful experience. Sometimes that self-knowledge, that learning can be a really hard journey um, in leadership. And I typically use a lot of assessments. How many of you have taken like a DISC assessment? Yeah, Strength Finders, Myers-Briggs. Yeah, everybody's hand went up on that one. That's awesome. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a bunny trail here and talk about career assessments because I think because this is a school, there's probably a lot of you who are maybe at this kind of career midlife figuring out what's next thing. You know, you're kind of moving forward and you're maybe getting ready to get a degree. Um, so there's a couple of assessments that I just wanna like lay out here that I think are great for careers. Um, who has ever heard of the Strong's Interest Inventory? A couple of you. So it is a great tool that is based on the Holland Code that was created back in 1970 by a guy named John Holland. And what's fabulous about it is it determines what your career interests are. So if you're looking for a job, um, it's really good to make sure that it's aligning with your interests. There is, I'm gonna give you a little hint. There is a cheapo version online called Self-Directed Search. Just do a Google search of Self-Directed Search and you can get it for 10 bucks. The um, Strong's Interest Inventory is a much more expensive assessment. Now the challenge, the reason it's cheap is because I think it was written in 1970. So the jobs that it offers for you are not jobs that you would want, but it does give you some general kind of career direction. And I always try to couple that when I'm working with folks on career with another tool called Kiersey. Who's, who's ever heard of a Kiersey? You again. Um, <laughs> so a Kiersey 
um, is very similar to a Myers-Briggs. But if you go out to Kiersey.com and get their career version, 20 bucks, it's a great tool. It shows you your personality. So you can kind of put those two tools together and you have the interest in terms of careers and how that aligns with personality. And sometimes it allows you to like, uh, let something different and unique emerge. But make sure you pay the 20 bucks, bucks for the career assessment because it gives you the Holland codes that I talked about earlier in the jobs um, that it refers for you. And you can find all of those jobs on Job and Family Services under those codes. So it's a very helpful tool in terms of like really doing research around like what do I wanna be when I grow up. So that was my bunny trail. I'm gonna come back into talking more about leadership and assessments that I use typically for leadership. So some of the ones we talked about, I use a lot of Hogan. Who's ever heard of a Hogan assessment? That's a tough one. I'm not gonna talk any more about it other than I'm glad you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> I think the primary assessment tool that I think really helps with self-knowledge for leaders is a 360. How many of you have undertaken a 360 process? A lot of you, that's awesome. So a 360 is not fun, nor is it easy, and my personal preference in 360 is to do 360 interviews. So what I like to do is get stakeholders that are close to the leader that I'm working with, um, peers, directs, boss, others, and have a 30, to, 30 minute to an hour phone call. And in that 30 minutes to an hour, I can learn a ton about those people. And I like to give it to them straight in their feedback. So I don't like fluff it all up and put it into a nice report where I interpret the data. I give it to them pretty raw. And it's a great learning experience and it really helps people learn to know who they are. And a tool that I find really helps increase self-awareness, something that I find incredibly valuable in this journey. Another tool I use a lot of is the DISC, and I saw a number of you raise your hands. The reason I use a DISC so much is because we all don't work alone. Do we, any of you work alone? No. We work with other people. And you know what happens with other people? They're annoying. <laughs> Right? Right? When they're not like me, oh my gosh, they do that thing and this thing, and I'm thinking, oh, that's what I do, right? We have these opposites, these polar opposites, and what happens when we look at a DISC profile is those opposites kind of pop up, and through doing that profile, you can learn, well, not only about yourself, which you may know a little bit more about yourself, but what's making that other person tick? And it really helps in collaboration and teamwork a lot. And it's a tool that I use a lot when I'm working in a team environment. So people have a better clarity of understanding. You know, sometimes leaders who lack self-awareness um, can be what I would call an insecure leader. Don't raise your hands on this one. <laughs> An insecure leader will kind of implode, right? Goes inside, internal, they just like hold it in, and ugh, they're like mad, but they don't show it. Well, they don't think they show it. Or they explode, and they kind of just explode all over the place. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a client who ran multiple medical centers in Ohio, and she was a classic person who would like explode with people. You know, she'd bring them in her office, she had a very black and white sort of thinking, it's kind of my way or the highway, this is the right answer. I probably, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing here, you need to do this. And when somebody said, no, there's another way, she would get angry. Um, she demanded performance from people as a way of her getting a seat at the table, right? So she wanted them all to perform at this level to advance herself, but she wasn't so concerned about advancing her team. And especially people who she felt particularly competitive to her. So when she saw people that, she had one person in particular who was the clear succession, right? The person that's next in line. 
And instead of pulling that person along, putting together a development plan, how do we take you to that next place? She did everything to give her this little tiny box and keep her in it. That was not, not what we were looking for, right? Um, so she felt threatened by this person. You know, this person was a threat. And that comes out of being an insecure leader. Here's the thing that probably was the biggest thing for her was, <sighs> every meeting, that was the feedback I got from everybody. She disrespected everyone and their ideas and their thoughts. Her body language was really loud and she knew everything. So there was no space for anybody else to really learn and grow. I'm gonna take a little bit of a diversion here. I'm gonna tell you a different story because I've talked all about this one person. Now I'm gonna talk about another, another story in another company. And the reason is because it was a great story about conflict. So insecure leaders either avoid conflict or they are combative. They don't look at healthy as a conflict, it, conflict as a healthy thing. So in this organization, it was a manufacturing company and we had two leaders who were really at the top of the house who were changing roles. So they had about 200 people in each organization underneath them and we started the journey with what? Guess what we started first? 360, right? And I started hearing a bit of conflict coming and I saw it in meetings with the two of them where there was a little jibing back and forth. And I'm, I'm having all of these 360 discussions and finally I get to a guy and I, he said, well, do you wanna know what this is all about? And I'm like, yeah. And he explained to me, these guys are both engineers, fresh out of college, 20 years earlier and they started, and the first guy started six months before the other one, and when he started, he was given the, the new cool project. It was you know, the new greatest and latest and greatest technology that they were implementing at this plant. So he took that and he ran with it. Six months later, this new other guy started. Well, he thought that project was pretty cool too. And so he somehow, I don't know the details of the how, but he managed to wiggle that project away from him and he took that project. So these guys are starting out here at engineer level and then they're getting promoted and promoted and promoted. Pretty soon they're at the top of the company and all these jibes and resentment and anger that had happened between the two of them 20 years earlier had poisoned the entire water system. Everybody was angry with everybody else. Nobody trusted anybody else. Um, I mean, the stories I would hear, I'm like, really? I, I watched the one manager in a meeting and his like red face and very angry and yelling and the other guy like, here's the bus and I'm gonna throw you under it and very unhealthy behavior. So I'm coaching these guys and um, I asked permission after I did their 360 if we could have a three-way meeting between the three of us to talk about what I had uncovered in this journey. And they, they agreed, they said, sure. It was a very hard discussion. Um, and <laughs> they, you know, I mean, I, I think about, you know, you don't expect to um, need tissues when you're dealing with these kind of folks, but I had to find some napkins in the room. Um, because there was a lot of tears shed. It was a very uncomfortable uh, situation for them. At the end of the day, they apologized to each other. They owned where they had made mistakes and they walked out forgiveness for each other. They forgave each other. They took each other off the hook and said, okay, we're gonna start fresh, we're gonna start new. And you know, that was kind of like the cathartic event. You thought, okay, so here's the cathartic event and you know, what's next? Is anything gonna happen from here? And about a month later, we were having the beginning meetings where we were beginning to talk to the plant people about these two guys switching roles. 
Now, up to now, they did not know this was happening. So we had, you know, maybe 30 to 40 people in a room at a time, and we're telling them about this change. I'm not. I'm just kind of sitting back watching. And um, the leader who had taken the job from the other guy, this was the other guy's team in the room. I told you this other guy stuff, this was going to get confusing, right? Um, but a woman over there, she stood up and she started screaming at who was going to be her new manager. Because this, this poison had gone really deep and she was angry. And I knew we had made some progress when the man who was currently her manager stood up. He stood in front of the other man and he said, calm down, sit down. And he started talking about all of the qualities of this other gentleman. And from there, you know, the healing began through the entire organization. But conflict can become a very powerful aggra aggravator <laughs> that poisons organizations. And insecure leaders um, can really take conflict and blow it, blow it up, and it can be really challenging. I'm going to switch back here. I told you this will be a little confusing, but to secure leadership. So going back to our first person, we did our 360. I was really grateful that that day was a snow day because the day I did her 360 feedback, she had to stay home. She lived in the Cleveland area, and it snows a lot up there. And therefore, I had to stay home when I was grateful to not have to drive. The reason I was grateful is because their offices are glass. All of the walls in their offices are glass. And when she got her feedback, she sobbed because it was harsh and it was hard. But what she did with that feedback was transformative. She began to pull her team together in meetings. She began to have um, brainstorming sessions, right? This is the person who's always right. She put um, a flip chart up in her office, and if somebody had a new idea, she had them come in and write it down. She started doing one-on-ones and actually listening. We went through this place of it's 80% listening, 20% talking. And to get her to stop being the expert, having to be in charge, right? And learning to hear what the pain and what they needed. And she put a development plan together with the woman that I talked about that was like, like dying on the vine, right? A brilliant woman who needed to be challenged, needed to be energized, she did that. And so transformation, you know, I, I watched it occur. Um, Secure leaders know their voice, and they're not afraid to use it. But they also don't need to please other people, right? They're, they're doing the right thing because it's the right thing. I think the most important thing about a secure leader is power flows from them to others, to empower others, to give them what they need versus flowing toward them. Because when a leader is insecure, they want all of the power flowing toward them so they can control it. A secure leader says, go forth and do. And they really enable, and em enable their people to be their best that they can be. And probably the most primary thing, they're not afraid of conflict. They recognize that conflict is healthy. And they encourage it. When they see something starting to go underground, instead of letting it go there, they pull it up. They bring it up so that people see it. There's not one style of leadership that would define an insecure or a secure leader. There are lots of different styles of leadership. Um, there's charismatic leaders like an Oprah, right? It's all based on the personality. There's authoritarian leaders. How many know any authoritarian leaders? <laughs> Has anybody ever met one? Oh, I love the laughs. But you know, there's certain places I want authoritarian leadership. I want our military leaders 
to be authoritarian. I'm sorry when you say, take that hill. I want the people behind them following, right? Sometimes it's appropriate. But for this talk, we're going to talk about transformational leadership. And transformational leadership is seen in all kinds of organizations. Um, it's also seen very much in the social scene. So if we think of like Mahatma Gandhi, back in 1947, he was a transformational leader. <coughs> he was able to get millions of people to buy into a vision that they could be free from Britain. And then he walked that out together and he, let, he created a vision and a dream that other people made their own vision and their dream until they realized that vision in 1947 when they were released from the power of Britain. We have our own Martin Luther King, right? Same, same kind of thing. So transformational leaders are change drivers. They are transformation engines, right? They're doing something that oftentimes is really big. And in organizations, how many of you work in an organization that you would say needs to change? Just you? <laughs> really? Really? I don't believe you're the only one. Oh, her too. Okay, a few other hands going up. I don't think there's an organization in the world that doesn't need, that isn't in a place of needing to change. We may not like that, but change is where the world is at right now. How many of you are familiar with John Cotter? Just a couple. You again. You're always, you've always got your hand up. You know. So John Cotter um, is what I would call probably the father of organizational change. He works at Harvard. He's a professor. And he has his eight steps to organizational change. And you know, he's written bunches of books on it. And he's like the, the leading expert, I would say. But you know what he says? 70% of change efforts fail. 70%. So when you look at that, you know, what's behind that failure? There's a lot of things that people will say it's behind that failure, but I think the biggest failure in leadership, or the biggest failure in change is a lack of leadership. And when we look at what do we need to get things moving in a new direction? We need leadership. So we're going to talk about seven key leadership characteristics that drive this transformational leader. And it all starts with vision. So Seth Godin says transformational leaders don't start by denying the world around them. Instead, instead, they describe a future that they would like to create instead. Transformational leaders think about the future. They pick a time, like, you know, some marker in the future. Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? I just made airline reservations for my in-laws last week. And what I discovered in that process is that it's pretty cheap to fly southwest sometimes. <coughs> Their vision statement from 1970-something was their goal was to make it cheaper for air travel than to travel by an automobile. The reservations that I made for my in-laws were $78 a person to fly from Tampa, Florida to Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, wow, right? But here's the thing about vision. Southwest Airlines put that vision together, and then they put together a strategy to support the vision. All of our planes are going to be the same size. You know, we're, we're going to keep our fluffs, our frill, frills, frills and fluffs down to a minimum. We're going to engage our people. I mean, they had a whole set of strategies around that one vision. I work with a company. Um, it's a small software company, and, and I love them. I love them almost as much as I love working with Scott. Um, and I, one of the things I love about them is their market. 
So they work with um, child welfare agencies. And I have a software background, and they create software for child, child welfare agencies. A very interesting kind of like twist, right? The CEO of this organization um, impressed me in our first meeting because he told me about how he got to the vision for his company. And he said he spent months going out with caseworkers on child welfare calls with parents and children. And he would sit on the floor and play with the kids, feed them Cheerios, you know, engage the children and listen while the caseworker engaged the parent. And he watched the process. And he realized that there was a lot of efficiencies to be gained in the process and that software could actually be very, very helpful in that process. And so he created a product that really helps reduce the caseworker's time so that they can be more attentive to doing the things that they need to be doing versus filling out a bunch of paperwork. What that did for him was create his, his vision statement, which I'm going to read here. He says, we are a very small company, but we have a mighty big vision, revolutionizing the delivery of services to vulnerable populations. We make solutions that improve the quality of the lives of case managers and social workers in the human services field. So what he did with that vision is then he took that big vision, right, and he anchored that for his entire organization. And he created not only a vision for where the company was going in terms of a market, but now what is it that he is doing to create a culture to, that people want to work there? And how does he get people engaged? And the other part of that vision was the internal vision of driving a culture that is like pretty phenomenal, honestly. Um, vision comes at multiple levels. This is something that I've learned over the years. There's the, the big V for an organization. There's the kind of medium V. Because what happens when you take over a team, they need a vision, because their vision aligns with the big, the big V, but it isn't the same. So they need a vision. And then there's the, the leader's vision, right? Who am I as a leader? And then there's the personal vision. And I think that there's multiple levels of visioning and thinking through this process. We're going to talk more about that, but vision is a big, a big deal in, in really leading well. The next characteristic of a transformational leader is to be courageous. That means they have to make super hard decisions sometimes, things that aren't popular, stand up and say things that really nobody really wants to hear. <laughs> um, they have to have strong conflict management skills. Do you notice how I keep coming back to that? They have to be unafraid to walk into conflict. They have to take calculated risks sometimes and have difficult conversations and stand up to poor performance. And they also have to take real strong personal ownership, be, have that self-awareness, and have courage. There is another gentleman in this, in this company that I'm talking about, the software company. He ran, he was the third employee of the company. So he was like, you know, pretty big cheese. He had the entire development organization, and anybody who knows anything about software company, development is a big part of a software company's organization, all reported to him. And, you know, when he came in, he was able to, like, move and shake and get things moving, get products out the door. But they were coming up with some new vision, with some new things that were going to be really powerful and market changing. And he did some very strong introspection and he said, you know what, I'm not the guy. I'm not the guy. And he went to the CEO and he said, you know, I'll look for a job. I'd like for you to give me a certain amount of time so I have the opportunity to find a job. And the CEO said, are you kidding me? I'm not letting you go. And he found the perfect role for him. But he did recognize that he wasn't the guy. But imagine how courageous that was to just stand up and say, okay, 
I'm not the guy, but somebody needs to come in and lead this that can take this company forward. Because he cared more about the company than he did himself. And that doesn't happen by accident. So what they did is they went out and they did the market search and how many of you ever are recruiters? Anybody a recruiter in here? Yeah, we have a recruiter. That's always the fun job, right? Going out and find the perfect person for the perfect role. So they went out and they found this guy who had all of this technology experience and all this background and was an amazing people leader and they brought him in and I met him for lunch a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you found it. You found it. This guy's amazing. And what he's able to do is because he speaks the language, he speaks geek. Anybody in here speak geek? It's a unique language. <laughs> I've worked with a lot of them over the years, so I kind of sort of speak it sometimes. Um, but he speaks geek, and he's able to communicate with these guys in a way that's extremely powerful. And he knows what their, what their strengths are. He's been able to take this team and reorganize it, get rid of a few people that weren't working. Not too many, though. He just was able to align them to their strengths, get their strategies in line, get their goals, their objectives, get everything in line so that they were walking down the right path. Because what happened prior to him is there was a lot of void, right? There wasn't clarity. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how to get there. They had this really good idea from the vision, really good idea, but no idea how to execute, how to get there. So you need people who can, in a transformational leader who can motivate people to buy into the vision and then help them execute on it. It's really key. Because if you just have the big idea, it's only what I used to have a boss who would say, that's just merely interesting, right? <laughs> merely interesting. We talked a lot about self-awareness, but it is a key characteristic of a transformational leader. You've got to be able to have that self-awareness, like this gentleman who said, eh, I'm looking inside, I'm not the guy, right? To really be transformative, you have to know thyself, leader, know thyself. You have to be humble and vulnerable. Do those words make anybody uncomfortable? Maybe a little bit, right? We don't like those words because they feel very exposing. But that is what transformational, transformational leaders are. They're not the big talking head. They're humble. They're willing to admit when they're wrong. They know who they are and they're, they spend that time in self-reflection to continue to let themselves emerge. They do things like painful 360s and ugly processes like that that <coughs> sometimes hurt, but they're willing to open the door to do that. The key thing, I think, that transformational leaders do is build trust-based relationships with people. So when Scott spent the time that he's going to start doing now for all 4,000 people, of writing an individual note that was meaningful, not just the same, the same. I'm, it, it's building those trust-based relationships, right? People are like, oh, he actually cares about me. And beside the fact that he cares about me, he actually notices that I do this thing or that thing. How powerful is that? They display empathy. They walk the floor. I used to have a guy <laughs> that um, I worked with, and he had this big fatty corner office. I could not get that man out of that office, no matter how hard I tried. I tried to get him to walk the floor to talk to his people. I tried to get him to do breakfast meetings. I tried to get him to do lunches. He would not leave that office. And you know what happened? His team imploded. I had people calling me all the time. This guy's a disaster. And he was a really bright guy. But he didn't engage with the people. And if you want people 
to follow you across hot coals. When you get a big vision and you're standing here on this rock and there's a bunch of hot coals, just envision them, and there's another rock over there and you're saying, I need you to get to that rock and the only way is to cross hot coals. How do you get people to do that? You get people to do that by engaging them, by empowering them, by freeing them, by listening to them. I can't say listening enough because one of the biggest things that I talk to about with leaders about all the time is you need to shut this and open this because people need to be heard. They need, that makes them feel valued, sorry, and important. The leader is the conduit. They're just the conduit. Transformational leadership builds capability in people. And that's the goal of a transformational leader. Has, have anybody here, has anybody here heard of David Rock? Not even you. <laughs> Disappointed. <laughs> I thought you knew everybody. Well, you're going to go look him up now. David Rock runs this thing called the Neuro Leadership Institute. And he wrote a book called Your Brain at Work. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, and in that, he talks about change resistance. Why do individuals resist change? And we think they all resist for the same reason. But what David Rock discovered is that's not true. That there are five reasons that people resist change. And one of them, it's, it's called a scarf model. Yes, I don't have a scarf on today, but scarf. So the S is for status. So some people resist change because they're going to lose their fatty title, their job, their corner office, their whatever that makes them feel important. The next one is a C for certainty. Some people, this rock that they're standing on, they do not want to move off that rock, and they want to be certain that if they ever get to that other rock, that some things are going to be there with them because they don't like change, and they want to know that things are going to stay the same. The other thing that the next one is autonomy. Um, people who resist change because of autonomy they want to have their own independent thing. They know what they're doing now. You can give them a project, they'll run with it. You don't micromanage them, they're happy. Now all of a sudden they've got to go do this new thing and they can't be autonomous. So they resist that because they want to have autonomy. The next one is relatedness. It's all about the people. So when you're in the middle of a change process and all of a sudden what happens with people? They start leaving, right? We go through downsizing, and people start walking out the door for whatever reasons, or I can remember one company I worked with, they were escorted out the door, and I knew what the problem was occurring with the company when they also put all of the potted plants in the office and put a price tag on them. <laughs> <laughs> I knew then it was time to write my resume and get out of there. But that's what happens in change, right? And so people who are relators, if their people are getting hurt, man, they, they struggle. And the last one's fairness, right? That's not fair. <laughs> I had it this way before, I want it this way now. And if there's a lack of fairness, they really don't respond well. If you are a transformational leader and you have not taken the time to know your people, there is absolutely no way, no way, that you can take those people forward because they're never gonna trust you enough to let those types of things out and be known. Transformational leaders need to know, they need to make it so safe that, that I'm willing to stand on this rock and I'm gonna go fast because I'm walking across hot coals and I'm not gonna probably walk slow but to take the risk, to run across those hot coals to the other side, to follow your, your lead. So a big, big, huge component is really 
people needing to understand and be willing to follow you wherever you lead because they trust you. Encouraging innovation and creativity. Transformational leaders encourage innovation and creativity. This company that I've been talking about, the software company, they have what they call free Fridays, twi two Fridays a month. And on that free Friday, the people are allowed to work on any project that they want as long as it's work-related. So remember this like vulnerable population thing that's part of their vision? Some of these developers got together and they said, how do we help these vulnerable populations? I can't actually talk about the product that they're developing because they're still in the midst of it. But they got together and they created this like amazing product that is gonna give so much more information proactively to caseworkers so they know about the abusers, the abusing stepfather, and they know about the drug addicts, and they know about all of the people in these children's lives that are risking, are, are putting them at risk so that they can help achieve that vision of helping support vulnerable populations. But they would have never been able to do that if they didn't give them this space to create and innovate and do something different. And they've created a whole new product line just based on giving them that level of freedom. The last one is really accountability. And you can do all kinds of things, but if you don't hold pe people accountable, it just won't work. It's that simple. So at the core of transformational leadership and driving change is this vision thing, right? I'm passionate about vision because of my own personal vision story. Probably before I started working with Scott, yes, before I started working with Scott, I, was, I felt like I walked around with a pebble in my shoe all the time. Like, I'm just not happy with my work, right? And it's always uncomfortable. I changed jobs, I did a million jobs, but none of them took that pebble out of my shoe. And I spent some time and I went through a process of creating my own vision. And in that, I wanted to know, like, what kind of life do I want to be leading? What kind of structure do I like in my day? You know, do I want to be, family is a key value for me. So how can I be aligned with being able to be available to my family? Now, at the time I wrote this vision, I didn't have any grandchildren. But when I wrote my vision, I put babysitting my grandchildren one day a week was a requirement. And um, I didn't, I, you know, I'm not sure if that's what caused me to have grandchildren, I don't know. Um, but bottom line, I spent a lot of time in this and wrote this in a, multiple pages, right? So I really understood and knew who I was. And as I was laying in bed one morning, maybe eight years ago, I started thinking about my day and I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm living my dream because I'm thinking about, I have some counseling clients, I have some coaching clients. Oh, guess what I get to do at the end of the day? Pick up my grandchildren. And had I not taken the time to really clarify for myself my vision of what I wanted in my life, I would have never created the strategies like going to University of Texas at Dallas and getting my coaching certification and knowing all of those things that I wanted to do I would have never done them. I would have just continued doing the corporate thing and doing the nine to five and feel like I'm in a box in my office and I would have never known. So I'm passionate about vision. And I've left behind with you, I think maybe you got it coming in, is your own kind of leadership vision tool. And like I talked about, the multiple levels of vision, right? You know, this is your leadership vision. This is who you want to show up as a, as a as a leader. One of the things I really feel like really strongly about with my clients, they resist it sometimes, you might too, is I want them to create a symbol of their leadership. And the reason is, is because when we have a visual, a symbol, something that is a picture, I had one guy who was a southern magnolia, I won't tell you everything behind it, but I remember it so clearly because it was such a powerful symbol for him. And when you have that picture, 
that you can look at. You don't have to remember the three pages that you wrote about your vision story because it creates a neural pathway in your brain that will remember for you everything that that vision means to you. And it's neurobiology. So I really encourage you as you go out and you take this away, don't ignore that part. Take the time to create your vision um, because I really believe that each and every one of you can live your dream. And I know this, I know this because I am living my dream.